Okay. Oh, I can hear it. There you go. Okie dokie. On Wednesday, August 5th, 1998, I arrived in the former Soviet Republic of Turkmenistan to start my new assignment with the International Monetary Fund, otherwise known as IMF. I was going to be a bank supervision advisor to the central bank. Bank supervision is not exactly the most exciting or sexy profession. No one in the history of mankind has ever gotten laid by coming up to someone in a bar and whispering in the air, Hello, I'm a bank supervisor. <laughs> Geographically, Turkmenistan is in Central Asia and is surrounded by Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, and Iran. For centuries, the country was a loose collection of nomadic tribes that freely roamed the Karakum Desert until the 1920s, when the Soviets took over and forced the tribes into joyless Stalinist cities comprised of concrete, sprawling concrete apartment complexes. I was based in Ashgabat, the capital city. It's in the middle of the desert with temperatures going well above 100 degrees every day. Most of the buildings are painted a pink pastel or blue or green and were in desperate need of repair with their peeling paint, graffiti covered entryways and crumbling walls. The streets were full of potholes and there was a thin layer of dust covering everything and the whole city was wrapped in a web of power, li power lines. In the middle of all this decay was a shimmering white marble town square, designed by French architects and built by and dedicated to the country's dictator, otherwise known as Turkmenbashi. Turkmenbashi was a short, obese, petty dictator with a disturbing fascination with his own looks. Plastered throughout the city were enormous posters, some several stories tall, of him smiling down on his subjects. He was also obsessed with his hair. During the first six months I was in Ashgabat, his hair color went from a grandfatherly gray to a sexy blonde, and finally to a manly brunette. <laughs> with each new do, all the posters throughout the city had to be torn down and replaced with a new and improved Turkmenbashi. In the town square were several monuments honoring him. There was a statue dedicated to the victims of the 1948 earthquake that leveled the city. The, earth the earthquake was represented by a bronze bowl shaking the world between his horns. Struggling to escape the rubble was Turkmenbashi's mother holding up a gold-plated baby Turkmenbashi, <laughs> saving the great dictator from the ravishes of the earthquake. The highlight of the square, however, was a 250-foot three-legged tower with a 40-foot statue of Turkmenbashi's with his arms held high. The statue was clad in gold, real gold, and the entire golden edifice rotated with the sun so that Turkmenbashi's face was never in the shadows. Turkmenistan is one of the more isolated former Soviet republics, and virtually no one spoke English. They were all Russian speakers, and I did not speak a word of Russian. With the help of the IMF colleague, I hired Gulia as my interpreter. Gulia was in her 40s, about 5 foot 4, and rail thin, with short jet black hair. During the Soviet era, she was a philosopher advising the government on local policies. Since the Soviet breakup, she has been working as an interpreter and manager for various investment projects. Both she and her husband, a celebrated local painter, came from wealthy families and were among the Soviet elite. Gulia's family was headed by her grandfather, a well-known and widely published professor. Growing up, she said they always had a couple of servants, a rarity among Soviet families. But then the Soviet Union collapsed, Hyperinflation struck, and they lost everything. At the office, Gulli and I quickly developed an efficient office routine, and things were going well until about a month into the assignment when I discovered I had a problem. I had crabs. <laughs> For two or three weeks, I've been itching and itching, you know, down there. I thought with the extreme desert heat in Ashgabat, I developed some sort of rash. However, in the last few days, the itching and itching had been getting worse. So I checked it to see if everything was okay, you know, down there. 
That's when I discovered the crabs. I had no idea how I got them, but I strongly suspect the towels at the hotel I stayed at in the, when I first arrived. The one thing I was absolutely sure of is I did not get them in the traditional way. <laughs> I had no warm and tender memories that I could finally look back on, I could finally look back on with a sheepish grin. The next morning, realizing something had to be done, I tried to discreetly ask Julia where the nearest pharmacy was. She kept on asking why I wanted to know, and I kept up making excuses. I finally told her my mother wanted to know what drugs were available over the counter. To my surprise, she accepted that answer. After work, I went to the drugstore that Gouli had recommended and discovered it sounded like the pharmacies in the U.S. The shop was small, with a long counter running down the middle, and painted a dreary hospital green. But otherwise, it was clean. However, there were no products, and more importantly, no crab killer on the shelves that I could <laughs> casually pick up and pay for. Everything, everything was behind the counter. I didn't know what my next move would be. <laughs> the following morning, I had to go to work to withdraw some money. So, of course, Julia had to go with me to translate. I can't do anything without her. On the way to, on the, way to the bank, I felt like a nervous schoolboy. Finally, I gathered enough courage to tell Julia my problem. She didn't understand. <laughs> Apparently, certain words were not included in her English vocabulary. <laughs> I then had to describe, in excruciating detail, what the problem was until she finally understood. To my great relief, she was very cool about the whole thing. We finished our business at the bank and went back to the pharmacy I had been to the night before. And Gulli explained my situation to the pharmacist. As a small crowd gathered around, the, ph <laughs> the pharmacist quickly realized I didn't speak Russian. He then raised his voice and over-articulated when talking to me because, obviously, if he speaks louder and more clearly, I will understand his Russian. <laughs> well, I didn't understand a word he said, but everybody else in that damn pharmacy did. <laughs> Sadly, they didn't have what I needed, so they called around and found a drugstore that did have it. It is important to know that Ashgabat has a population of about a half a million Turkmen, who are generally five foot nine or shorter, with olive skin, black hair, and almond eyes. And there were only maybe 150 non-Turkmen foreigners like me in the entire city. Being a six foot one white guy, I stood out. And whenever I walked down the street, entered a store, or sat in a restaurant, people would watch me out of the corner of their eye, leaning in slightly to eavesdrop. We went to the second drugstore, and fortunately, they had everything. Unfortunately, the when the pharmacist gave me the crab killer, I realized instructions were in Russian. So the pharmacist then had to explain to me, in a loud and clear voice, <laughs> with Gulia translating in my ear, extremely in specific instructions on how to apply the crab killer. You know, down there. The gathering crowd was highly amused. Riding in the car on the way back to the office and holding the precious crab killer in my lap and desperately trying not to scratch in public. I began to, to relax and think about what makes a good friend. As someone who will make you laugh when you want to cry. Someone who doesn't judge. Someone who will be there when you need them. A friend is one, someone who will translate how to apply crab killer to your crotch in a drugstore to Turkmenistan before a nosy crowd of onlookers. <laughs> that day, Guli and I became friends, and we're still friends nearly 20 years later. Thank you.